But now here we are in 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we would ask ourselves, male or female here this morning, and on live stream or in attendance, how is it that one comes to a place of unfeigned faith? We live in a world that provides ample opportunities to kind of fake it. To say when we're at church, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. And then we step into our private lives and we live a discouraged life. We live a, a life is lacking faith in the will of God, the ways of God, the work of God. And then we're with somebody else. Maybe it's a brother or sister in Christ. Well, how's everything going? Oh, everything is wonderful. It's just wonderful. And the truth of the matter is when they step back and the Holy Spirit says, no, it's not. No, it's not. You know that viewing material. You know that reading material. You know that anger problem. You know that whatever it is, it's not right. We have all had those conscience pricks by the Holy Spirit, none any more than the fellow behind this pulpit. But there needs to come that place in our lives where with resolute determination we say, wait a minute, the only way that structure can be built where we dwell in unfeigned faith is board by board. Principle by principle, decision by decision, we make it and we sink it down into that which is foundational in our lives and say, yes, I may have had feigned faith when we had an argument on the way to church and when we pull in the parking lot of the church, oh, hey, how you doing? And everything is just right. Or we've done that with our children. A number of years ago, not so many, there was a mother who asked me to help counsel her alcoholic son. And he lived some ways away from where I was a pastor. And he just would not come up, and so I just was led of the Lord to just drive to another state and just show up at the place where he worked, a wealthy individual. And so I did. And he came to the door, it was after hours, he came to the door of his business and and he said, may I help you? And I said, yes, uh, are you so-and-so? And he said, yes. And long story short, uh, he and I chatted after, after he was kind of shocked. And I, he says, you drove all the way here? And I said, yes, sir. For what reason? What else you got? Nothing. Just to tell you about my Savior. He said, okay, all right, come on in. And we talked for probably two hours. We had another time of meeting or two. And eventually he trusted Christ as his Savior. But that's not the end of the story. The mother began growing in the Lord as well, but yet struggled in her own spiritual life. She was very domineering, very emphatic, very, this is the way it is. And she was that way. Her children were reared that way. And she would led a hard life, a hard life, and understandably so. But little by little, she began chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. Every decision he would make, she would find some way to criticize it. Every single thing, and the daughter the same way. As a matter of fact, they had nothing to do with her mother. But when he got saved, began to grow, and the mother began to grow, long story short, everything was moving, but then she kind of reversed and went in the other direction to where neither one of them would have anything to do with her again. It's been many years now, many years since that's taken place. She would come to church. Everything is just right. Text message. <laughs> Email. <laughs> Very wealthy family. I received word this week. He took his life. My point is that we can come to church and we can act like the best parent in the world or the best daughter in the world, the best son in the world. We can, we can put it on. And I'm pretty easy to fake out. You can fake me out and, and I'll just believe, boy, everything is great and it's wonderful. But at the same time, if I'm doing it for you or you're doing it for me or for before whomever else, especially our children, if we're feigning it and they know it, oh my. 
And the only remedy for that is salvation if you're not saved. If they're not saved, the only remedy for that is salvation. And then after salvation is to grow in the Lord. And as I think about A.D. 52, and here's a Jewess who believed. But now we come 50, uh, 14 years later to 66, and here is a woman in whom faith was unfeigned, and it dwelt in Lois and in Mama Eunice. How does that happen? How does a transition take place? Well, I'm going to ask you to turn one more place as we bring it to a conclusion this morning, and that's the book of Romans. Would you turn there with me, please? The book of Romans, chapter 16. And as you're turning there, there's four things that I believe are necessary for unfeigned faith. Like Daniel... Unfeigned faith is courageous. Like Daniel, it was not easy. He could have faked it. He could have done a lot of things and just fit in instead of going to the lion's den or the three Hebrew children going to the fiery furnace. But courage is necessary. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, for perfect love casteth out fear, for fear hath torment. Courage is, must be involved in this matter of building unfeigned faith, true faith. Not perfect faith. None of us are in that category. But growing faith, building faith to where we have unfeigned faith. So it requires courage. Secondly, like Hannah, it is a conscientious faith. And my mind goes immediately to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1 where the Bible says, Be ye therefore, it's a command, be ye therefore followers, mimickers of God as dear children, as beloved children. So here you have like Hannah who was a, had conscientious faith as she was weeping before the Lord in, in the temple and the tabernacle to say, Lord, oh, dear God, and, and weeping and saying, dear God, I am barren and I, I believe that you can show a conscientious faith. But the conscientiousness of her faith was after God gave her the son and she said, Lord, if you'll give me a son, as soon as he is weaned, I will lend him to you for the rest of his life. And the conscientiousness of her faith then brought her young son Samuel to the priest and said, here he is. And on an annual basis, she would come and visit a conscientious faith. Yes, unfeigned faith must be courageous because you're going to run into those times. Romans chapter 7, 7 verse 21 says, I see then that there is a law that when I would do good, Evil is present with me. It's going to do its best to undo what unfeigned faith requires you to do. It takes courage, a conscientiousness. It also must be a committed faith. Oh, I can't go any further than the Virgin Mary. You remember when the angel came to the Virgin Mary? She had not yet been conceived of the Holy Spirit. And the angel said, here is what God, you're blessed among women, and here's what God's going to do. What was Mary's response? What will men think of me? Here I am not married and here I am with child. That was not a response. Well, how am I going to afford it? This is going to be a little baby. I'm not married. And what if Joseph goes a different direction because it's not his child? No, she didn't do that. She simply said, be it unto me. Be it unto me, as thou sayest. So it was not only a courageous faith, it was not only a conscientious faith, it was a committed faith where she said, all right, if God's in this, I want to be a part of it. She said, be it so unto me. And then it also involves a companion faith. Oh, I think of Jonathan and David. As Saul tried to kill David, and he even tried to kill his own son Jonathan, and yet they as brother with brother, even though we we're not brothers uh, biologically, they were brothers in the Lord and brothers in heart. And so it was a companion faith. And I'm reminded of 2 Timothy 2.22, Flee also youthful lust, but follow after, run after, put your hands on righteous faith, charity, and peace. And here's the companion part. With them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Unfeigned faith is very much different than feigned faith. Feigned faith wants to go it alone because they don't want anybody to know how they're not what they're not when they when they should be. Feigned faith is not those that are conscientious. 
of following through on what God has in their lives. They always make excuses. It's somebody else's fault. Or I'll only do it one time. It's not the conscientious faith that I made a decision before God as a child of God. And, and it, God requires me to ask forgiveness if forgiveness is required. Or to forgive if forgiveness is required. And But, but you don't know the circumstances, preacher. No, you're exactly right. I don't. But what it do, the one who does is none other than God. And he gives those commands. Amen or no? Amen. Amen. It's a courageous faith, a conscientious faith, a companion faith. Those who call on the Lord, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 